Hey, so I wanted to redo a video about OCD. Um, I filmed this yesterday and it's really ranty and manic and I just want to try to focus in a little bit because I think this issue is really, really important for people with injury from benzos and psych meds. Um, you know, otherwise known as neurotoxicity or encephalopathy. I love how I said the other day that I mix up encephalitis and encephalopathy and then I did it again in the video. Um, you have to really excuse my speaking style. Um, it can be error prone and um, chron chronolog chronologically error prone. Um, it's really hard to go back over extreme trauma and pain and get everything ordered correctly, especially when you're trying to like, you know, tell a story and, um, you know, make something sort of listenable. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, that video that I posted about my full story, I filmed early this year. I think it was in February or February, February or March. But I wanted to do a quick video, God, fingers crossed, in regards to quick. Um, but I wanted to sort of talk about OCD and sort of the insidiousness of OCD and the types of OCD I've dealt with and seen in the community. And um, let's think of this more as obsessive compulsiveness. Um, if you don't like the concept of being disordered, then just don't think about it that way. So, um, one of the main forms of OCD in the community is what I've dubbed, and maybe other people have called it this, I'm not sure, but I call it belief OCD. And belief OCD is really, really prevalent in people with, um, you know, especially like very severe um, brain injury, encephalopathy, neurotoxicity, etc., from psych meds. Belief OCD is almost this force inside that needs a hundred percent belief in the disease state and the like reality of the disease state. This obsessive compulsiveness inside is very, is not nuanced or intellectual. It just wants a hundred percent belief in the disease state exactly as the disease state is being experienced. And even when we people who have suffered from this receive this belief it's like a bucket with a hole and it often needs to be refilled and refilled and refilled and um this brings about a lot of fraughtness in our community when you have you know sort of suffering chickens with their heads cut off for totally lack of a better expression and I am of the chickens with my head cut off I'm of the people um, so you know I'm not using that to be disparaging I'm just creating a visual when you have people in that state who need constant belief in what they're going through and often receive sort of you know a nuanced belief or sort of partial belief or lots of comparison talk this can be really triggering, especially to people with very, very severe injuries. And a lot of these people end up like leaving the groups and not getting, you know, sort of the thing that they really need to keep just like getting through the day, which is just being told that they are believed. Um, I have a friend going, you know, who suffers from this very badly. He probably has maybe five to 10 minutes before like this sense of utter disbelief at what he's going through and like and this idea that like no one is like like no one is going through what he's going through sort of empties out and needs to be refilled and it's this sort of like perpetual state of awe and horror and yeah like dread basically um but it's very very much so commingled with this sort of like wait, no, you don't get this. No, wait, no, I have to explain this. No, wait, like, let me just find the right words if I could just do this, if I could just create this project. And, and, and I'm only saying this because I was exactly the same way. Um, and mind my scooter, riding around on my scooter, I, you know, I live in a climate where there's lots of bugs. So if you're outside, you kind of have to stay moving. So it's sort of intuitive plus akathisia. So, but my akathisia, I would say this is like, I wouldn't even say this is akathisia, I would just say it's like, you know, 
need to keep in motion. There's no, I'm not in pain like that right now, which is really beautiful and, you know, like extraordinary. Um, but yeah, this form of OCD, like what else to add? You know, I think I just kind of want to put out there. If you see people who are like this, or sort of observe the state of like disbelief, you know, try, try as you might, if you have that, you know, the upper hand on control and they don't to see this as a very insidious um, manifestation of brain injury. Um, often when people, you know, the more people disbelieve that there's anyone like them or that, you know, everyone who's like them is gone, um, often this is indicative of more severe injury. And so it just should be met with like as much compassion and just like, you know, try to figure out what that person really needs, you know, get to the source of that if you want to help them. Um, this was a huge, huge issue for me and anything that rubbed up against my 100% belief of what I was going through, almost to the point of like, I needed like, you know, one for one empathy to be, to, to have this feeling of obsessive compulsiveness, give me any leniency, give me any reprieve. Um, and it was not, it was very short lived. So, you know, this is just a horrific, horrific state that people go through um, in this injury. And it's very unique to this injury. And because of this, you know, like, I'm going through this, nobody understands me, I'm alone. And, and even it can go as far as like, there's like a conspiracy to make me feel like other people get me, but they don't. Like, it can feel very much so like, you know, just, it can, it can bleed into like paranoia and an obsession and rage and confusion and the need to isolate and alienate. And so I think it's really important we just meet this with as much compassion as possible for the people that, you know, have a little more control or don't suffer as much from these sort of ruminations, obses obsessions and compulsions. Um, another form of OCD that I've sort of observed or this, like I have a theory about certain types of OCD that arise and pure OCD that arise for people in this state. Um, and I was trying to explain this in my last video. I don't know if this is like beyond the pale or like, you know, a very strange hypothesis. So bear with me, but I've noticed my OCD, like the, th the things that were obsessive and compulsive for me almost were contraindicated to my healing. And so part, and I've noticed this in other people. Um, I don't really want to add much detail that because detail, detail to that because I think you know. I just kind of I just think it's it's so weird that like a lot of my obsessive compulsiveness was forcing me to focus in the wrong places, not focus on diet obsessively, which is the only thing I should have been obsessive and compulsive about, um, or just overall like when you're sick to this extent it's very much so in alignment to have your entire life for the most part revolve around your health so i need to repeat that when you're sick to this extent it is very much so in alignment to have most of your life revolve around your health absolutely because the stakes are so high and you're often teetering on you know giving up and so it it would make perfect sense to, you know, like excavate into your diet and make sure that every food you're eating is aiding your health and not inhibiting, inhibiting it. It would make sense to really like dip into things around autophagy, which is cellular repair. Things that create autophagy are things like sauna, cold therapy, diet change, movement, um, uh, impact on the muscle thing and fasting. If and I say all these things very much so um, not in promoting them, but to say like geek, geek out on them. And many of these things I still struggle to do um, because they're too severe on my body. But that is, if they're too severe, I think one of two things can be happening. The first is that you are too, too much in acute withdrawal. This is like one to maybe four years of very acute symptoms that happen early off the drug and it can be you know four or five you know more it can be more than that but it on average this tends to be people's time frames one to four years of very acute symptoms um in that time frame it makes sense to just be what you need to be eat what you need to eat 
eat as healthy as you can, do what you can stick to, and just get through the days. Absolutely. But as time goes on, if you notice that things are getting worse in some way or they're just sustaining and your, you know, your metabolic health is just terrible, like you can barely walk to the mailbox, you know, like nothing is progressing. It's, it, and, and you feel this has become a life or death situation. It's very much so worth digging into autophagy. And then the issue, but the issue is most of us can't do those things. Like we'll do a cold plunge and then we get vi- so sick, we're like sick for months, right? Or we do... You know, we try to do sauna. Um, I could never even go into a sauna. That would be way too claustrophobic for me, but I have a sauna blanket. And it was, I, it gave me akathisia to try it. So, but I know I pushed it too hard. Um, but I would not even have been able to try it had I not been eating the way that I'm eating. So for me, you know, there are really important things to be working on. But to me, the gateway drug is diet. And getting yourself low carb, comfortable, eating intuitive foods, making sure the water you're drinking feels great, you know, getting yourself to where you feel like as good as you possibly can on food and then tiptoeing into autophagy, okay? It makes sense to live a life based off of these things when you are this sick, absolutely. I mean, to the point of basically obsession, this should be your life when you're this sick. But that's not what my brain was doing at all. I mean, it's, it's not true in that I always tried, you know, the diets I was recommended and I always tried to eat healthy. I always tried to move to a, to maybe to a fault because I was pushing up against a wall that wasn't moving. So I always tried to do those things, yes. But a lot of my time and thinking and obsessing, obsessing and ruminating was around what I would do to work again as an incredibly disabled, in distress, person with akathisia, with pure OCD and OCD, with level 10 nerve pain, with the inability to be in a car, drive a car, grocery shop, I mean, need I go on? A debilitated life. I spent a lot of time fixating on what I would do and what kind of work I could do as that person. That is not, in my opinion, normal and not something that makes sense to me now. Um, So I'm just kind of throwing this out there. I don't know if anyone relates to that or, you know, I'm sure many people relate to this concept. I believe, it's my belief, most people in this community have some form of belief OCD, at least for a period of time. But this thing I went through of like, how can I work to keep myself from being homeless? This concept was a huge OCD loop for me. Um, Loop, rumination, hamster wheel thing for many, many, many years. And I suffered unbelievably as a result from it, just spinning my wheels, trying to learn, you know, learn things that were absolutely beyond my bandwidth and beyond my physiological capability. And again, not focusing on this sort of malignant thing, you know, I've often sort of pictured my trauma and, and, and my chronic you know, illness, my, this disease state of my body is like scrap metal that, at, that I could not seem to metabolize. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you're still sick and you're getting sicker and you're not metabolically healthy, like I knew there had to be some answer to that you know I mean there were there was really a binary it was like you can't live like this so you know let's see what this whole thing around carnivore looks like like why are so many people doing this these types of diets and like curing their autoimmune disease you know cure like coming back from serious stages of cancer coming back from you know, extreme states of mental, quote unquote, mental illness. It, it was too conspicuous to me. And I, I had actually, like I mentioned in my last video, gone down this road. Um, but, you know, again, like my, I had a form of OCD where if I was too skinny, then doctors would think I had an eating disorder. Then I couldn't, you know, like qualified for disability. Therefore I would be homeless. So this, this, this preoccupation with homelessness 
I mean, I, I think it may have kept me from saving my own life a lot sooner. And that's it. This goes back to this sort of is this OCD a manifestation of the disease state in your body that wants to win? Because I will tell you what, when you go on a low carb diet, and I mean low carb diet, man, you feel the war inside. And it can be confusing. And I can see why so many people stop because, well, for one, like maybe they're not that sick or, you know, whatever. Um, but it can be very confusing that this diet is actually good for you because there is so much adaptation to getting off carbs and adapting to fat that your body has been completely like down regulated from accepting and using and utilizing that, that and like there's bathroom stuff there's 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 sleep stuff there's pain there's you know definitely a couple months of like for for people in severe situations you know unbelievable suffering from withdrawing from carb carbohydrates i mean it is no joke so you have to go through this war with your body to get control over your body and i can see why so many people stop because it's like no this is actually isn't healthy but and I, I said this to my friend recently and i hate the word pudding but i love the expression the proof is in the pudding because this was my absolute last card I had to play. I mean, I had nothing left. I had no puffs within me, you know, like no puffs of smoke left in me. Like this, you know, I don't know what metaphor I'm going with there, but I was done. Like there was just nothing that could be salvaged from my current situation when I made this choice, nothing. So I needed a miracle and I found it in this diet, but I have a long, long way to go. I mean, potentially years of just getting my metabolic health on track. So I just, but I find it interesting that my OCD often lent itself to not doing this, doing the opposite of this, in, 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 being triggered by people that talked about diet or talked about um, attitude or neural retraining. Um, so, and I want to say two things about that. The first is that you know, when you're in, when you're on fire and you're just like, you know, burning alive, a lot of these things aren't really that appropriate. So you feel that dissonance with people. You're like, well, if you're doing that and you're finding luck from that, we're not even in the same universe. We're not even in the same stratosphere of suffering, which again, lends itself to belief OCD. <laughs> like, and, and so then that's the other part of this is like, these things that people mention in groups, actually when you have more leeway and you get to be a little healthier and stronger, these things can actually benefit you quite a bit. I've had neural retraining type stuff and really somatic experiencing and breath work save me, like take me back from the brink many, 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 many times. But when I was in the thick of it, this stuff did not benefit me it wasn't even, a, it was not that it didn't benefit me. It wasn't even just approachable. It was like not even in the same stratosphere as I was living. And when I, people talked about this stuff, it was so triggering. I mean, it was like what they said took on blunt, blunt shape. And I, I just couldn't bear it because I couldn't even relate to it. So anyway, I want to say this because I'm just saying like, look out for these things. If you see people reacting where they're so triggered, they can't even take a suggestion. Like these are not shitty people. They're people who are suffering, suffering really, really, really bad. Like this is a very strong indication of like how, you know, the strength of their encephalopathy and just like, please offer these people your grace. And thank you to those who offered me grace, especially in 20. 2019, 2020, and 21, where I was just, yeah, 19, 20, and 21, those years where I was just absolutely losing my mind on Facebook. I had no ability to take in information, suggestions, or even just other people's, like, their own personal experience where it's like, that's just their experience. Like, it, it's not, I don't even know, like, I don't even know that person. I don't, I don't really care what they, like, now it's like, I don't give a shit what any stranger thinks about me online. I mean, they could straight up come, someone could straight up come to me and be like, you're the weakest person I've ever met. You haven't done anything. You need to do a vegan diet. And like, 
you know, you're pathetic. Like you'd say anything to me and it would just roll off me for the most part. I mean, if you catch me on the wrong day, I'm not, you know, things aren't perfect. I'm still suffering so greatly. It's, it's insane. You have to travel so far to get back to yourself. It's nuts. But like, I don't, the stranger couldn't say anything to me now that would like phase me in that way. And so again, I just, you know, like again, underscoring, like if you notice this, these people are just suffering so badly, especially these, you know, these cases of people saying, like, no one's like me. Well, you don't get it. Well, this is how it is. And they re-explain and re-explain. You know, they're not doing that to drive you nuts or to be, you know, not compassionate to other people. They're just not even dealing in the emotional playing cards of like anything approaching reasonable normal neuro healthy not in they're not in the stratosphere okay so an offshoot of this sort of what i find to be very insidious form of ocd again that almost seems to de like derail the host the person from actually doing the work they need to do you know for some people it's like getting off the drug for me it was like doing a very extreme carb low carb diet um, you know, not focusing on homelessness, which is not the issue at hand. The issue at hand is like getting your body, getting my body to move and eating, you know, kind of an extreme diet and seeing if I can get inflammation down in my body and get my metabolic health back and my strength back and my stamina, etc. But anyway, I find, I just find that that's so weird that I've noticed in, in so many people that this form of OCD almost, it's almost like it, it has an agenda to get the person to not focus on what they need to focus on. Okay, that could just be like a symbol, too symbolic and not actually what's happening, but I just find it very bizarre. Um, an offshoot of this, you know, of, of OCD I had, I had so many different forms. Early on, it was like more classic, like, you know, I'd flush the toilet and I'd be like, there's fecal matter in the air and this room is disgusting and I'm breathing in fecal matter. Things like that are sort of more what you would think of as classic OCD. You know, like germ related. Um, quickly, pretty much immediately, it was around cleanliness. Like I would need to clean the space I was in. And to me, it, everything looked disgusting to me. Like I couldn't unsee it, but I had no energy to clean. Like I had no ability to lift my body. So it was just a paradox. It was like torture, a torture chamber of just being like, you need to clean this room, it's disgusting, but you can't lift your own body. And so I would just freak out or like freak out at my partner. Like this place is disgusting. You need to help me clean it. You know, just so panicked. So, so obsessive. Um, there were many, many things like that. But one thing that happened, I mean, something that evolved and sort of started early, but then it evolved and just got worse and worse was this project I've been working on, which is, I believe, almost 100% born out of the brain injury. So it actually, I mean, it may have started out kind of cool and interesting, although I'm not sure I came up with this idea. I mean, I know my brain injury, as if another entity was living inside me, came up with this idea, but it sort of reminded me of myself um, and was related to things I was interested in. But it got to the point where my relationship to this project was just absurd, absurdist, you know, like, surrealist absurdist where I was doing something I hadn't created that was beyond my physiological capability like my 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 cognition and my physical body could not do this project it took too much it took like healthy people shit to do this and I was doing it in so much pain even when I got kicked out of my house I was still working on this instead of like you know, focusing 100% on the things I needed to be. I was doing this and touching the, printing things out and touching the ink and getting, like this, I have severe multiple chemical sensitivity, severe. I won't go into it, but it, it's, it's like otherworldly suffering. It's otherworldly suffering in my in, uh, guts, in my, mostly on my left side of my intestines, feels like it's being electrocuted when I touch certain things. I was touching ink that every time I touched it, it felt like my guts were being electrocuted. I, and I couldn't stop working on the project. So for lack of a better word, this was sort of like a, sla a form of slavery where I was doing something I hadn't created without the ability to do it. And I could not stop doing it. I could not stop doing it. I don't, how to, I don't know how to emphasize that enough. Um, no, it wasn't like, you know, 
there was no choice but to do the thing I was doing that I didn't want to be doing, that I hadn't come up with, that I wasn't capable of doing. But my brain was pushing my body that was basically like a flesh puppet to do it. For years, for years. And I think the project will be cool. Like the result of it will be cool. Maybe in, if I have a next life in this life. But I can't express to you like what, what it feels like to go through something like that with yourself. Like in your relationship with yourself. It's utterly dehumanizing. And there were, ma there were many things around this concept for me. You know, other obsessive compulsive behavior around um, like pursuing certain people, um, not like consent, like consensually for them, but that people that I wouldn't have ever wanted to date or be with. Um, things around sexuality that were like, I was like robbed of my sexuality or my sexual preferences um, or my sexual inclinations, um, <laughs> you know, just, and just years, like, like years of this, living like this, like just a flesh puppet at the behest, at the, at gunpoint with obsessive compulsiveness. Um, some of the most insidious OCD you can have are when you're doing things that kind of remind you of you. You're like, I think like I would have maybe liked this, but the things you're doing around that, you know, in that, in that specific form of OCD are not like you, like the curiosity gas pedal in your brain is not meant to be pushed to the floor. You know, like I'm not, you know, if I go to the beach and I pass all these houses, right? Like they're really cool houses on the way to the beach that I, I go to sometimes. And I was like looking up every house on Zillow and looking in the house and I needed to know what the backyard looked like. And I was like, maybe I'm doing this because I want to become a real estate agent. Like, I think maybe, maybe this is me. This seems like something I, I might like, but it's like, no. And once my diet, my diet shift and I played around with water, um, I, I was drinking smart water because I thought it was going better than the Culligan water that my family has, but it was still like, you know, my body was masking it just to be able to like pull in the water. And I think this has to do with like either the way the water's filtered and or that my body is not absorbing nutrients normally because we're not like, we're not utilizing nutrients normally, a lot of us, and we're not detoxing, you know, or like letting out excess in the, in a right way and in an appropriate way. So this smart water, which has like, I think like synthetic electrolytes in it was like messing me up so badly. And once I stopped that, you know, I started flirting or flirting with different waters, uh, flirting. I was, I was like absolutely at my, you know, at death's door because water was causing me to have severe, severe DPDR, like dementia vibes, DPDR, where I was losing consciousness. And so I tried like 15 different waters, give or take. And once I got rid of smart water, the, DP, the obsessive compulsiveness around looking up every house I passed and needing to look it up on Zillow and I need to do this and that, that went down by about half. So it's just like, this is why it's just so important to do an elimination diet and really figure out just like what are the least toxic foods for humans and get get on that you know get on that type of diet maybe like you know sands without dairy and then try dairy again like make sure that's working out really but even before you do that really make sure your water is working out for you you'd be really surprised how like we can be sensitive you know probably some of us to the plastic that the water's housed in the water itself can be maybe just too overpowering and we can't really handle handle that nutrient load um you know etc cetera, etc cetera. the way the water's filtered etc cetera, etc cetera. there's lots of variables even with water so really go there be a scientist be a scientist of your own body and what you put in it but these are the obsessive compulsive things are coming that are coming to mind um I had a lot of other weirdly weird offshoots like around flowers. You'll see if, if you look at my Instagram, there's flowers everywhere on my Instagram. I had things around putting flowers in bird baths in my house. Again, this is not something I would have 
This is not something my true personality manifested by any stretch of the imagination. It appeared cool and it was a thing to do to keep living and focusing on, but ultimately you don't want to be living in your obsessive compulsiveness forever. This is not not a way of life, it's a torture chamber. So you have to figure, well, where is this coming from? What is causing this? And get to the bottom of that. And if anything in your obsessive compulsiveness is saying like, fuck you, if I hear, you know, if I'm anything pushes up against my st the status quo, I don't know, maybe consider that OCD might be acting in the favor of the disease that's going on in your body and instead of the repair of what's happening in your body, potentially. It's certainly, whatever it is, even if it's just symbolic, it's, it absolutely can derail and defer the work. And man, you gotta do the work. If you're not walking a mile a day, you know, maybe three or four years off benzos, you got some work to do. And I certainly did. And I wish I had, you know, I, I, like I explained in my video, my long video, I did the absolute best I could in an impossible situation, insurmountable human suffering. There's just, it's, it doesn't belong on earth. It's like the stuff of medieval torture, what I've gone through. And so it's just extraordinary to be alive and be sharing this with you, really. Um, I did this video yesterday and I hope this was a little more, less manic or organized. Sorry about the scooter, just I have to keep moving when I'm outside and I'm not ready to go inside. And I'm also, you know, just back from the beach, that's why I have a towel around. Um, but I hope somebody got something from this, you know. If you feel that gas pedal pushed down in your brain, you're doing a lot of creative things and you cannot stop yourself, okay, fine. But consider that these things are from brain inflammation. Consider that your DPDR is brain inflammation, that your body's not detoxing normally, and make sure to be working on autophagy and diet so that you get your get things upregulated, get things Get your methylation going. You know, I need to learn more about methylation. I probably shouldn't speak to that because I don't know enough about it. But you know, you really want to be working on cellular repair. And the first step is diet. My my thought, a lot of people think the first step is circadian, doing circadian stuff. If you can work on your circadian rhythm, like, but for me, I couldn't I couldn't fix anything with my circadian rhythm until my cat wants to come close to my scooter while it's in mid motion. That's not good. I couldn't do anything with the circadian rhythm until I fixed my diet because I needed to just detox a little bit more to move a little more to get around the sun. And also I, but again, some of this did happen just getting like going through the violence of getting kicked out of my house because I, I had the sun waking me up and putting me, you know, putting me to bed. Right. But I think it would have happened a lot sooner had I gone, gone on a more extreme diet for a, for a while and given my body some time to repair. Um, but some people think you can do circadian work and some other forms of autophagy without changing your diet all that much. So play around with it. But if you can't, like if you're noticing and you do a cold plunge and you feel like death for two months or you do a sauna and it's nearly impossible or you, you know, try some nutrient dense food and it's too much, like your body can't take it. You know, this, what I've done is very extreme, but if you're on your deathbed and you, you know, you're willing to try something extreme, like it's worth just geeking out on this, you know, just geek out on it. Like how, what it's done for people. Um, you know, you're worthy of the fight. You're worth the fight. And it's, it is really, you know, things are still can be very harrowing and painful, but like, I don't, I am the fucking baddest. I'm the baddest. I can't even believe what I have done to stay alive. It's crazy. If I gave up tomorrow, I would be so proud of everything I've done. I would be so proud. Wow. Okay.